All right. Shelf. Plus members, interwebs. I always forget the cameras here, the computers here, the cameras here. How's everybody doing out there? Throw in the live chat where you guys are from. If you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, no matter where you are, just let us know where you're watching from. Plus members, we know you guys pretty well at this point, but uh, if you want to remind us where you're from in the chat on Zoom, you can do that as well. Good to have everybody here on a not too late Tuesday night. Yeah, it's not Getting so bad. Getting through the week. Yeah. The week's off to a good start. I always thought this was on Wednesday. In fact, I think on our last live stream, I wished everyone a happy hump day. Probably. And you're like, it's, oh, that's right, it's, that's right. it's Tuesday. Yeah. And it's still Tuesday. I didn't that? mute that. <laughs> was that a, a flute? Somebody's practicing hey. their jazz flute in the background in our plus group tonight. <laughs> All right, we've still got some people pouring in here. Do us a favor, type in the uh, in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Let us know what you're excited about. Uh, Manish from Phoenix, Tony from LA. We're in a little bit of a delay here, so it's going to take a second. So, Nate, what's going on with you this week? Holy wait, you know what? My my boss is just slamming me with work, dude. It's just relentless. That guy's terrible. He's awful. <laughs> That's fine. My, mine's great. I don't know. I don't know what. You're, I don't know, man. What you're doing been wrong. out both days. I mean, like it's. For you guys that are unfamiliar with Virginia Beach weather, it, it's can be it, it it can be twenty degrees one day and eighty the next, and we had like a good six week run of like Seattle weather, and now finally the sun's coming out. And uh, today, what mid eighty, super nice. Yeah. So, speaking of super nice, we have G's Hound from Australia. Oh, here we go. We're flowing in now. Mike from Chicago from Midtown Tennis, very nice. Joel Meyer right. from Milwaukee. Uh, let's see here. Max from New Hampshire, Sudeep from San Francisco, Pat from Charlotte, Angela from Angie. Is that Joel Arizona. Meyer? Like Joel Meyer tennis? The yeah, Joel. Well, yeah. Well respected. That's I sure, mean, I I'm think. sure there's more than one Joel Meyer, but if it is, good to have you here. Yeah, Joel. Joel what's going on, man? Thanks for tuning in. Um, all right. We got all kinds of people flowing in here now. Why don't we go ahead and get this party started? So for those of you that have never come onto one of these live streams before, um, Full transparency, we put these together for our Plus members. Our Plus members are, are on a Zoom call with us here. When we break for questions, we can actually see them on Zoom. We unmute them. They can ask questions. When you're part of our Plus community, you can do that. If you're not, we still let you watch, um, but it does get a little crowded in here on Facebook and YouTube. So a lot of the times, it's not that we're ignoring you. It's just we can't possibly keep up. So if you want our full and utter attention, the Play Your Court Plus membership is the way to get it. Um, also... Whenever we, run, whenever we run one of these live streams, we also like to throw you guys a nice little deal just because why would we not, right? We, we do run a business. We would love your support. So right now we are in the middle of offering our single strategy and tactics course. And a lot of what we talk about tonight um, is certainly relevant to that space. So that is 75% off and three bonuses. Three bonus courses off? are included. Three bonuses? Now. Three bonuses. Have you lost your mind? <laughs> So I'm going to throw that in the chat for you guys right now. And also, um, if you're not um, in the community at all, I'm really sad. It's it's $5.99 a month. So, I mean, call Nate. He'll, he'll lend you the money to join if, if you can't afford you're it. You're going to be a raise? Yeah. <laughs> um, but we also have a deal right now. We're 50% off our annual membership there. So you can literally get a year of membership for $25 or 50% off our plus membership. So if you're not in plus – and you want to be, here's a link for that as well. So those didn't populate hyperlinks. Hopefully you guys can figure out how to copy and paste. But we're not here to sell stuff. We're here to teach you guys some tennis. So let's get down to it. Theme of tonight, just 10 sort of easy tweaks, tips, mindset shifts, ideas that you don't have to go practice for five years to implement. This is you hear it, hopefully you understand it, you apply it tomorrow, you win more matches, right? Yeah, and I think if you take just a few of these and uh, start implementing into your match play, you're going to see these these big improvements. And, and we're kind of – we really work through a lot of different ideas. We were going through some stuff that we, we put out in, in the past and, and just working on new ideas and then just through the years of coaching of, of things that we're working through, you know, whether it be strategy or tactics or technique or mindset. And so we're going to have a little bit of all of that stuff in here tonight. We're going to have some technique stuff. Um some mindset stuff. We could talk about nerves a little bit, um, but all these are, are. If you can take just a couple of them, we'll start seeing big improvements in your in your match play. Get some more W's over those L's for sure. We got a top ten list here, right? We're working our way all the way down from from 
Yeah, yeah. Just like um, Casey Kasem's account <laughs> now. You got like the 10 best tips of 2021. Yeah, that was a pretty good impersonation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, to some degree, they're not, it's not the definitive top 10 list. But yeah, we're, we're going to go to what we kind of think are the most work from the, the bottom all the way to the top. So, number 10, shall we jump into it? Let's get to it. All right. So, number 10, we're going to start with just kind of shot selection technical choices if you will all right and this is number 10 is just about making the right choice on the shot selection right so what are we talking about let number one let's talk about the overhead all right oh, right out of the gates yeah right out of the we're gonna give you three here it. maybe more but let's just talk about something that we see a lot so on the overhead we see players behind the service line routinely trying to put the ball away all right. And it's a no, no. All right. I get it's it. It's just not realistic. It, it, it's not. And, and it's, a, a, I get it. The pros do it. And at a, a, at a high level, we see it happening. If you've got a ton of wrist snap and you're able to really, you know, get some pop on that overhead, um, it, it's feasible. But if you're behind that service line, you should be looking to set up the put away. I think that goes, I mean, we're talking about overhead specifically right now, but that goes for a lot of different types of shots too, right? Like I think a lot of times we're trying to hit the kill button when it's just not time yet, right? You've got to put yeah. a couple more balls in play. We lost our screen there, sorry. Um, you got to put a couple more balls in play before it's time to hit that kill switch. And the overhead, you know, behind the service line is a great exception. The second we're going to talk about um, trying to hit a drop shot from too far away, right? From Oh, uh, yeah. From this one drives me insane. <laughs> so hitting the drop shot two, three, four feet behind the baseline. And for me, this is the biggest panic button in junior tennis and adult recreational tennis, but definitely the juniors are so guilty. Ashton Legum, if you're watching, I'm talking to you, uh, one of our really, really good juniors in the area. Phenomenal player. He actually pulls it off the and time. But phenomenal drop shot, so that's hard yeah, to yell. Yeah, so he never listened to me. But here's the idea here. It's like the drop shot is about positioning, all right? So – it's certainly something that we want to deploy, but we want to deploy it when we're inside at the baseline, when we have positioning over our opponent. But too often what happens is that we're trying to hit it from behind the baseline. So even if you hit it really, really well, it, your opponent has plenty of time to track it down. And the reason I was saying it's kind of a, a nervous kind of twitch is unfortunately in my career, I'm sure in your career, when we see it the most is, is when it matters the most. Right. When Somebody you, you can tell they're getting tight. And it's yeah. like, all right, deuce number six. And you're like, no, not the drop shot from behind the baseline. What are you doing? All right. So that's that's a big no-no. What's the other one that we we were talking about today that we see commonly? The swinging at high floating volleys. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's that's a huge one, guys. Let me let me make one quick switch here. Sorry, I'm getting a lot of plus members coming in and I like can't keep up. What's up, plus? There we go. How are we Sorry. doing, everyone? So, yeah, the swinging and high floating volleys, this is like just a painful one, right? You you know to punch high volleys. You, you hear it in your lessons. You see it on YouTube. We all talk about how the racket doesn't need to come way back here. You have the put away, and you just get excited. You get those big eyes. It's another one of those situations where I just think you're trying to do too much because you know you've got the point on lock. And we're not talking swing volleys. We're not talking about a, a ball that's looped up and is descending to some degree where you can you know get under and rip it. We're talking about that ball where you're, you've rushed in, the ball is floating up, and you, you, your, your swing path has gotten really, really big. This is a transition volley. Just like the overhead, you should be focusing on setting up the put away. Going back to the overhead for just a second – we we kind of in the industry we always talk about like the the uh, the, the teaching pro overhead all right and, it, and the reason that it's called that is that you're just put in a lot of situations where you're trying to extend the point um but do damage to see what the response is and a lot of times this is done with a slice and you're working the ball you know off the court playing at an angle or whatever it might be but you're setting up the position you're not trying to win with raw power behind the service line. That's right. I and think that wraps up number 10, right? I mean, yeah. summary there, again, just right shot choice for the right shot selection, right? Yeah. Don't try and overdo it. Don't try and hit winners. You're not in a position to hit winners. And this sort of flows into number nine, right? Our, our number nine on the top 10, <laughs> 2021, <laughs> top 10 yeah. tips. Countdown. A lot of these are going to kind of flow in together. We just didn't, you know, this is more very, very pinpoint of the shot like it's kind of a, a you know a do and a don't. Right. All right. So number nine, we're talking about uh, staying patient and playing the percentages. This one's huge, right? Because this is where maybe my favorite coaching tip, particularly for like high school juniors, because people call all the time or chat us all the time and say, 
I've got, you know, a junior playing high school tennis. What is the one thing I could tell them that's going to win them more matches? And I always go with the rule of three, which is just put the ball on the court three times before you try something too hard. Um, probably a more advanced way of saying that is just play offense from offensive positions. And it yeah. usually takes more than one or two balls to get in that offensive position when you're in these long ground stroke rallies. So when we talk about staying patient, particularly against players like pushers, we need to think about a couple of different things. Which one would you want to, you want to pick out first year from our list? Yeah. So uh, the, the one thing that we really, Scott and I were, you know, avid poker players enjoy some gambling periodically. And the thing is like, that's who you want to be as a tennis player. You want to be a good gambler, right? And what we talk about is not hitting on 17. And hitting on 17 is what we see all the time. Is, That's a blackjack reference for those keeping track at home. Yeah, yeah. It's You're behind the baseline and you look to change direction, hitting down the line, or you try to hit the winner. We just put a video out on this. We want to talk a little bit about that for a minute because that is a huge, yeah. huge no-no. I might even go yeah, uh, might board, even right? board here. So – and we talk about this in the singles course a ton, but it's just decision making when you're in position versus when you're out of position. So to to give you the broad strokes, when you're pulled really far off the court, this is just not the time to play offense, right? You are very clearly in a defensive position up here, so you need to play a defensive ball. And a defensive ball is high to give yourself time to recover, or cross court, which is the furthest distance to give you the most amount of time to scramble as close back to the middle as you can get. What we see a lot of players make in terms of mistakes is we see them get pulled out wide and we immediately enter this fight or flight switch and we're like, all right, I'm out wide. This is it. I'm ripping the ball down the line. And unless you paint this corner, really, unless that ball lands right here, anywhere else, more likely it's going to land in this general area right here. And this player is going to take a couple steps over and they're going to rip a backhand cross court before you even made it back to the middle of the court. So what we think is taking control of the point by trying to hit aggressively down the line, we're at a position is actually putting us on defense, not offense. So that goes into what we're talking about here. You want to play offense from offensive positions and you want to play defense from defensive positions. So I think it's pretty self-explanatory in my example this is very clearly a defensive position. When you're more in the middle of the court or when you're able to step inside the baseline, when you're you know on the way to the net, those are the times that you can play offense. But when you're pulled out of position, when you're reaching, when you're getting pushed back, you're on defense. You need to play a smart, high-probability cross-court defensive yeah. ball. Yeah. The, 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 what else we'll touch with this is you know we, we really push for depth – before direction, right? And, and so what I'm talking about here is when you're deep in the court, all right, if I'm in this point, oh, I got to touch the ball, right? And I'm playing from a couple feet behind the baseline. I want to be focused on keeping my opponent deep. Stand a little bit off to your left there. You're, yeah. You in the way, bro. Sorry, man. All right, so my, my goal here is depth. So – Direction, when direction is going to come into play, is that my depth has broken down my opponent and they've hit short, right? And so we put a video out not too long ago, um, and we talked about the 4 by 4 rule. So what the 4 by 4 rule is that when I'm behind the baseline, I'm playing for depth. I should be playing at least four feet over the net and four feet away from the lines. I don't need to take big risk, right? I'm in a defensive position. Now, once the ball is short, I've moved in. I've lost all this court back behind me, so I don't have as much court to hit into the opposing side. So now I'm going to play below the four-foot line. I don't have to, but, you know, the, the, the margins will improve. All right, and I'm, I do want better targeting. I don't want to hit inside. I don't want to hit at the line, but I certainly want to hit to a smaller target to do more damage to set up my position up here at the net. And I like your analogy here, too. We're talking about, all right, these are the times to attack. If you want to go with the poker analogy, these are the times to say hit. Yeah. You don't hit when you're on 17 and way behind the baseline, yeah, yeah. right? That's yeah. not the time oh, at I'll all. I'll get a three or four. It's cool. Yeah. Pull four here out of yeah. the deck. It happens every once in a while, and it's a shame because it's that every once in a while that makes you think it's okay to do it again. But it's a risk that really doesn't make sense. So. I think that wraps up number nine. Yeah, playing patient, playing the percentages. I think sort of like yeah. a high-level summary there. 
is when you're on offense, play offense, and when you're on defense, play defense. Yeah. Playing offense when you're on offense is almost just as important, particularly if you're playing against a pusher or somebody that you're having a hard time closing the point out against. You also have to recognize not just you know when you're in trouble that you've got to play defense, but when you're pulled inside the court, you got to play offense. Right, like it's yeah. not. It's not just if you're going to grow in the game, right. if you're going to improve. The the one thing I'll, I'll throw in here is like when the pros, like when are are they hitting at the lines occasionally, when they absolutely have to, right? So what what we're talking about is, you know, Djokovic is pushed forward into the court. There's a 98 percent probability of him winning the point, and Rafa aims for the line to get the passing shot, right? right? Like he's deadly accurate it's the only possible it's why it's spectacular it's why it's on sports center we're like i can't believe they made that shot yep. it was the only way he was winning the point right so but trying to emulate pro tennis strategies is not necessarily something we would recommend unless you're playing at a pro level that's right yeah because it's not low percentage for Nadal all because he practices tennis eight Nadal. hours every day since he was eight hey, years old plot twist yeah <laughs> yeah plot twist that's right <laughs> All right, moving on to number eight. And do us a favor here, guys. We'll open up the floor to some questions. I know we're on a delay on uh, Facebook in particular. Um, in Zoom, obviously, we're going to attend to you guys first. If you have any questions on the first two or anything you want to cover or interact with us on, go ahead and type some questions as here. We're going to move on to number eight, but we will come back to your questions as we see them here populate. Um, all right, number eight. Get your feet moving early and focus on getting your back leg behind the ball. This, the getting your feet moving early piece, I'll, I'll go after that. Yeah. This is huge for me. So one of my favorite things to say is getting nervous is an emotion and you can't control your emotions. That would be like walking into a funeral home and be like, hey, everybody, you don't need to be sad anymore. It's Everything's okay. Like that's not how that works. You're yeah. sad. You're nervous. You're happy. That's an emotion. You're not going to just change that emotion. But what you can do – is understand what that emotion does to your game. So for me, I know for a fact, when I'm nervous, the first two things that happen are my feet get up, like my legs get locked up, I'm not moving my feet very well, and my hands start to tense up. So all of a sudden I look like a very slow Tyrannosaurus Rex trotting around the court, you know, half, half stride, because my legs are tight and my hands are tight. So for me, I immediately focus on really bouncing around and to the point where like I look a little bit silly sometimes and that's fine. Like I'm in between points, yes. rude, in between <laughs> points, I'm jumping around, I'm bouncing back and forth and I'm just focusing on my feet. Why? Because it's way better than focusing on how nervous I am. It gives me something else to think about. And then the second thing, like I just mentioned, I know my hands tighten up. So I'm going to focus on relaxing my grip on every single ground stroke that I hit. As I start thinking about moving my feet and relaxing my hands, guess what happens? I move my feet and I relax my hands and the results look better, and that actually helps the nerves slowly go away. I, Nadal talks about it all the time. I don't know why we're talking about Nadal so much tonight, but Nadal Pretty talks good. about it all the time. What I hear. Um, he's worried if he's not nervous. He's actually, at yeah. this point, more comfortable playing nervous than he is when not. He's concerned when he doesn't feel nervous because that's not the normal state he's used to playing in. So that was the Me keep too. your feet moving early part. Talk about the back leg and why that's important. Yeah, so the back leg, so when you're tracking the ball, right, like uh, – when you're first starting out, you want to make sure that you're getting behind the ball. And all of tennis, it's always about being behind the ball. And so something that you can consciously do is focus. And, you know, especially with the, the open stance, we see that predominantly. But behind the baseline, when we're using this open stance, we really want to make sure that we're tracking the ball and getting our back leg behind it. What this is going to do, it's going to help you generate the easier power. It's going to make sure that you're using your legs when you're hitting the ball. All right, so you can get your feet using, you can get your feet moving, but that's not going to guarantee that you're loading properly. That's right. right? You may not be neat bending your legs, right? When you're getting your legs behind the ball, then you can start getting in that joint position to where that back leg is really loaded and working through that ball. And then, of course, when you're getting that short ball, stepping in and attacking. But the move of the feet, man, that, like this is probably the most important in, in my tennis career because I was so notoriously slow. When I started same, matches. Same, same here, man. Slow starter. Horrible slow. And so, not great pre 10 a.m. No. So that but, didn't help. But anything. this is what I realized. Mm -hmm. in, in, you know, it only took my mother and father and coach forever for telling me, but like, how, how early should you start moving your feet before the match? Yeah. Right. If you show up to a match using that 10 minutes, five minutes to warm up and think that's adequate, 
you're setting yourself up for failure. Think about boxers. By the time boxers enter the ring, they've yeah. already fought three rounds in terms of what they look like yeah. they've been sweating for five yeah. hours. I would skip rope. I would jog. If I was at a tournament where I had to kind of be, you know, orn call for the 30 minutes because God forbid they called you and you weren't there and get a default, I would, I would do whatever I could off in the corner, you know, whatever plyometrics or, you know, I could possibly do to start activating the body. It also gets your heart rate up, which I think combats nerves a little bit. It certainly feels like it does, right? Like yeah. if you just go out there from sitting sort of idle to then showing up immediately thrown into nervousness without getting your heart rate up before you step foot on court, the impact's going to be a lot worse. So this is not a suggestion. This is a prescription. Before, if you don't want to be as nervous when you play tennis, try and get your warm-up going off the court. And then even if you are nervous, it's super, super normal. We're nervous when we play. Nadal's nervous. Better. All these guys. It's a thing. It's an emotion. We can't control it. Just think about what it does to your game and do the things to counterbalance it. For most players, that's going to be focusing on moving their feet and getting their back leg behind that ball. That was a big thing for me when I was going through my forehand yips. Yeah. After a year and a half, Nate was like, "All right, I feel kind of bad for this dude. Just get your leg behind the ball." Yeah. That and I did. And the forehand yips went away. I was like, yeah. "Well, great. Thanks for yeah. letting me wallow in this for a year and a that's half." First, I was just scared you were gonna. Oh, you're a big fella would be falling down up. <laughs> Terrible friend. <laughs> Terrible friend. <laughs> Terrible friend. All right. Moving on. Moving on there to number seven on the Nate Bowling 2021 Top 10 Tennis Kid Countdown. You can't say that five times fast. <laughs> no. All right. Take it away. Identify your opponent's weaknesses and hit there. Sounds, Pretty simple, sounds right? Terrible. Everyone's it's like, I mean, come on. Hey, it's so thanks. obvious. That's it number seven, Casey. Me. <laughs> it amazes me, though. This is. This is it's. I'm gonna give you two ideas with this with this theme, but 15 people just left when we said that. <laughs> but here's the problem: as simple as this strategy is, the vast majority of players don't do it, and this is why we want to play the way that we like to play. Stop being so selfish. And I'm guilty. Yeah, I'm guilty. You know what I want to do? I want to hit huge forehands. I want to hit forehands from everywhere in the court. So sometimes I've been guilty of looking over and going. Man, that backhand is not that good, right? On the opponent, and but I want to hit cross court. But if I hit to the backhand, then I'm going to hit backhands. And I'm like, but I really want to hit forehands today. Yeah. And next, I know it's four all in the first set. And I'm like in a forehand battle with this guy. And at the end of the day, it, it, it may, I'm not just talking about. It's not as simple for a lot of players out there. It's just locating a backhand. But maybe their backhand, they hate slice. You've hit three slice, and they haven't figured out how to move up to the ball. Should be doing it the entire time. If Fed, if it's good or for good enough for Federer, if it's good or for Federer, it's good or good or for, for Federer. <laughs> <laughs> but but Federer sends probes, right? He'll hit that short slice, move them up, and when he realizes, especially someone with a two hander isn't comfortable moving in off of the slice, he exploits the court position. Can I take this one step further? Yeah. This is yeah. going to hit home, so brace yourself. How many of you? Are worried about how well you're hitting the ball in the warm up. Like, oh man, like if I can just get in a good cross court. Type in the chat, type in the chat in both Plus and on Facebook, YouTube. If when you go out there on the court to warm up, you're focused on yourself and how well your forehand is going, your backhand is going, you need to hit a couple more serves because you need that last flat serve in to feel confident. <laughs> Let me know in the chat because um, this is a problem most players I've ever coached deal with. All we do as high level players in the warm up is assessing our opponent, right? Like this is our, we're getting ready to go to war with this person. And this is the five minute preview of all of their weapons and all of their weaknesses. Yeah. Right. So if you're not using that warm up to very quickly figure out, oh man, like he doesn't like low backhands. Like, oh man, like I can't help but notice on the do side, every single survey hit was out wide. I guess I'm going to adjust my return stance to be a little bit further out wide. Those are the type of things you need to be picking out in the warm up and figuring out a game plan for before that first game even starts. So I think this identify your opponent's weaknesses and hit there sounds so simple, except that we don't figure it out until halfway through the second yeah. set. So we've been selfish during the warm up, trying to figure out like, how do I feel today? And then in the first couple of games, like I know I like to hit cross court forehands. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, this guy's backhand's garbage. Yeah. I need to hit it there. He so said then, it nicer than that. He didn't say, he didn't say your backhand was garbage. That's right. He didn't think it that way. He, he thought, his backhand <laughs> could be better if he practiced. It. The okay. other, the only other piece to address here, because the advice identify your opponent's weakness and hit it there does sound kind of simple. There is an alteration here that's yeah. higher level. We talk a lot about this in the singles course. Um, sometimes the easiest way to expose your opponent's weakness is to hit strong to their strength, yep. um, which sounds ridiculous. You're like, wait a second. So the guy's backhand is weak. 
you want me to hit this forehand? Yes, and here's why. If Timmy tennis player up here has a weak backhand, it's not necessarily weak when he's in position, but it's definitely weak when he's pulled out wide and then running to it, yep. right? So you think about a weakness, it's probably weaker when you're on the move to it than it is when you're set up. So if, if, this, if Timmy Tennis knows you're just going to pick on his backhand, he might camp out over here and just be taking a couple steps, and it might not be as weak as it looked in the warm-up when the ball is getting moved and around. And Timmy knows he has a weak backhand, right? right? So it's like it's sometimes, you He's know, expected. if we yeah, if we go to it too early, you actually can help them groove it, right? So that's why, like, it's it's different level tiers. It's it's recognizing it, playing smart tennis, playing the weakness, and then as Scott said, taking that strategy a level up and exposing the weakness on the move through positioning. For sure. That was seven. We're getting close. Yes, sir. Almost to the top five. <clears throat> On to six here. I've got a couple plus shots that I'll address super quickly here. Yeah. Morgan. Matthew Brush, what's going on, my dude? Um, every time I'm about to play a match, I feel like I need to warm up more. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll address this as nicely as I can because I, I think it's a funny, a funny thing <clears throat> that we think about. And I go through this too. I'm 37 years old. I've been playing tennis since I was eight. And there's something in the back of my mind. It's like, if I can just hit one more kick serve, it's, it's going to be yeah, better yeah. in the match. It's like, I've been playing tennis for, what did I just say? For 29 years. Right. One more kick serve isn't going to change a gosh darn thing in the warm up, right? So that mindset of like, you're as good at tennis as you're going to be before the warm up even starts and understanding that and then making sure you're using that time to really just understand who you're getting ready to battle against, I think is extremely important. So Matthew, you are not on your own there, man. I think probably all of us feel like, man, I wish you could just get a few more balls in the warm up yeah. and, and get it grooved. Yeah. The, I think you just focus on getting, you know, yes, getting some rhythm, right? I think that's huge, but I think it's about breaking a sweat. I think it's about getting that adrenaline and that heart rate up is, yeah, is actually a much bigger deal than you think. Your mind is telling your body it's go time. We're right. going to battle. Here we go. Right. Yep. It's like, if it feels like an exam when you're in the court, it's because you're standing, you're sitting still, right? Like that, you know, you don't want to feel that way. You want to, we're athletes, right? We want to get a moving. That's right. David says he's definitely focusing on his strokes and warm up. David, it's a common thing, man, but uh, this, this is going to be a, a big, a big change. And I think it'll help a lot. Uh, Matthew followed up with what's the best thing to focus on during a limited time warm up your opponent, right? Like we just sort of said, like, your strokes are good. Don't doubt what you have. Like your strengths, your weaknesses, they're not going to change much in a five minute warm up. What is going to change is your ability to build a really effective game plan against somebody you've maybe never seen play tennis before. So yeah, I mean that's that's right. Like you're you're getting a ton of information out of the court. But like remember, and for you guys that are like thinking about technique, I I, I just don't know that I, I would in a warm up. Um, yep. We talk about paralysis by analysis a lot. It's the surefire way to make yourself more nervous. Yeah, I would immediately – the game is sitting receiving. I would put my attention – you know, I, once I'm identifying the opponent's, uh, you know, weaknesses, strengths, all that good stuff, but I want to get into a rhythm to where I'm I'm feeling the ball. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting – feeling the spin off my opponent's ball. I'm seeing the weight of it, what's doing, what's the trajectory, and really get into – kind of the seeing and receiving part of it. I think that's the piece that we want to do into a warm up. Um, Cause it's like driving a new car, right? Every opponent's a new car. What is the handling? What is the torque? Right. Is their ball going to keep you low? Are they going to push you back? Are they pulling you and pay attention to that stuff. But if you're thinking about your backswing or your follow through, you're going to miss some really valuable information about what their ball does as well. For sure. I'm going to throw a bone to uh to a technique question we have in the Facebook group. I think it's Kitu. Uh, hopefully I'm not butchering that, but Wants to know about correct slice technique, clear the table, or knifing and going down on the ball. Oh, wow. So <laughs> I'm going to get some more on the chill answer this. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So he, I'm actually going to get some more. The, the reason I'm laughing is like we just did a video on one, and we have another video releasing, uh, gracious, next week on the latter. Um, they both have their place. Right. But so this is what I think is the biggest mix up. Right. Like, are you clearing the table? Right. So as I'm working through my swing, I want the rocket going down, but I don't want it going straight down. I don't want it going down an elevator shaft. Can you guys see that? Like, I don't want it moving this way. Right. So I still want my arm going through here, but I think what ends up happening, kind of the, 
the illusion, if you will, I'm looking for a rack. I don't have one. But as I'm you. working through my slice, I don't know if it'll fit in the screen. I'll just show him my hand. But if my hand – He's going to get a racket. But as I'm working through it and my arm is working down, I do want the strings, the racket tip down and then finishing up. So I think that's often – you need to get some new strings, nice, nice man. Strings Look at this there. thing, guys. All right. But what I'm talking about, I'm choking up so it'll fit in the screen. But as I'm working through, right, I'm working – and that's where they're talking about clearing the tabletop, right? But then the racket will dip down because I want it to finish – and I want my strings to finish here and then climb up, all right? Because you can see how that locks my arm out, all right? So to answer your question, yes. A little bit of both, <laughs> a little bit of both. I was getting water, so I, yes. I can't tell. Uh... Yeah, they, they're, they're, they both have their place. Um, and for more information, you should stay tuned to our latest YouTube, YouTube channel, video yeah. coming out next week. I will say the clear, <laughs> such a dork. The clear, the clear distinction is it shouldn't drop straight down. So don't think like you're coming aggressively behind the back of the ball. Think like you're coming more down a ramp. The tabletop just sort of gets us in line, as Nate was talking about. But we don't want you to think about you know necessarily flattening out like a table. We yeah. want you to come from high down the ramp, meeting the table, and then sliding across. Yep. Cool. You got it. All right, let's get on to tip number six here. Oh, this is one of my absolute favorites. So play points according to scoreboard pressure. So, so many of us, and I even hear coaches say this, like you just want to play every single point the exact same way. No, you don't. That's not true. That's terrible advice, in fact. Um, <laughs> if the score is 4-all, 30-all, it's way different than if it's 5-0, 40-love. If it's 5-0, 40-love, right. it's not incorrect for you to try and hit an ace on your second serve. I have yeah. no problem with that. Yeah. Uh, it is absolutely incorrect. At four all thirty all to try that yeah, right so scoreboard right pressure um do you want to elaborate more on like a couple specific situations like i know a lot of people don't know how to play like a 15 30 versus a 40 15 like when it's sort of still close but you have the lead or you're one behind or yeah and i think the game score accounts for a lot of it like scoreboard pressure i think a lot of times we don't think about what's happening on the other side of the court as well and that's right. that's why like if you're at four all thirty all um, you're returning just get the ball in the court yeah, you, you're not you're not looking to to take a, a a big risk here and try to rip something and make it happen. I know there's so many feel good movies and so many moments where it's like you know bases loaded, two outs, <laughs> bottom of the ninth, and he hits a grand slam. Like that's let's let's Nate's bunting in that situation. Yeah, I'm, I am. I'm going to try <laughs> to get somebody on base. Right. I'm going to try to get someone home rather. But um, but yeah, you're looking give your chance your your opponent an opportunity to miss. You, you want to play the, the point in the situation or positioning like you would any other point. So what I mean by that is, like, if I get a short ball in the middle of the court, I'm hammering it down the line, right? I, I know that I'm going to do that 99 out of 100 times. I'm not going to freak out and try to suddenly throw in a drop shot in. Like, right. that I'm going to do the same almost yeah, every time. There's go-to strategies that don't change regardless of scoreboard pressure, but. But if I'm up 40 low, 5-1. I'm going to see if that first serve is working. Right. I'm going to drop a couple. I liked – you took some notes here that I, that I liked about if the score is close, play with improved margins. So I had a match actually just this morning playing in, in a tournament and against a gentleman with all due respect, like a fair a fair bit weaker, um, like a 2-0 fairly easy victory. But it got to 2 all in the first set because I'm out there just playing loose thinking yeah. like, all right, well, like this guy serves really weak. I should be ripping a lot of winners. And at two all, I was like, okay, uh, you know, it's, it's time to dial it in. It's time to start aiming four feet inside both lines. It's time to give myself some net clearance and let this guy miss some. Like, it just depends on the type of day I was having. If I came out there out of the gates and everything was feeling good and I was hitting winners within a foot of the line, I would keep doing it. it didn't work that way, so I made the adjustment. The scoreboard got to two all. I realized this wasn't a player that I should be trading serves with. I made the adjustment. It's it's that type of scoreboard adjustment that we want to see you guys making. And a lot of times. You know, it's not in a situation where you're playing somebody that you, you think you should blow out, but um, it is in a situation where you're playing somebody close and the score isn't close because you're making these same types of mistakes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are times like at four all, 30 love. So Scott and I are playing, it's four all. He's serving love 30. And I haven't been able to touch his serve all day. And suddenly I get a look at a second serve. I'm going to be, I'm going to take a little bit more risk here. Because the reward is so much bigger, right? So for all, love 30, 
I'm like, man, second serve. If I can really get a hold of one, I'm not trying to hit a winner, but I'm trying to do immediate damage with this ball. The me being up 40 love puts me really close to getting the break. And if I miss 30, 15, those are the times that I got to take my chances. Right. But yeah, four all, four all, 30 all. It's like, yeah, yeah, I've got to, I've got to see where your nerves are at. For sure. Right. All right. I think that wraps number six scoreboard pressure. Basically the summary there is you just want to play based on what's going on. It's not, it's not the same mindset every single point. All right. We are down to the top five here. This one's interesting. I'm going to let you cover this one. The play, the momentum of the match. Yeah. So something. I, I don't know why it immediately reminds me of Andy Roddick. Oh, for sure. It, Agassi, Agassi, yeah. Agassi was the big one. I'm beating, I'm beating the crap out of you. Let's just get out of here quick before something goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, Agassi was like, I'm serving to the deuce court. I'm serving to the ad court. I mean, it's like service winner. Serve, he's, he won't slow the momentum down. And and that's what we're talking about. If you're winning and your opponent's making a bunch of errors or you have a hot hand, you want to speed. You don't want to speed up plays to the point that it's reckless, but you want to keep play moving, right? You want to keep this momentum. You want that your opponent to feel panicked, right? Don't give them time to figure out what's happening to get their wits about them. Or the reverse of that, if I'm on the side and suddenly the match is just slipping away, don't be in such a hurry to lose, right? Like it's about the MJ tactic. What's when, you're, when you're out of breath, bounce the ball off your toe on purpose <laughs> when you're serving. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a bonus tip, guys. If you are out of breath and serving, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with accidentally bounce the ball, off, the your ball off your toe. Oh, toe. man. Oops, I'm so sorry. That. That's awful. We should not endorse that. <laughs> right? But if, you are, if you're if you struggling to match, you're, you're down 0-3, the other guy's out, you know, she, he, she is out to the races, take your 20 seconds. Slow it down. Right, because not only are you getting your wits about you, you know, you're, you're calming, you're getting your nerves together, you're also disrupting the rhythm in which they want to play. Now, I'm not saying, you know, go over 20 seconds, but the rules are the rules. Like, take the time that you need, and that's what we're referring to is the momentum of the match. You got to play within it, or you've got to change it, depending on what the score is. I'm not sure there's a lot else to say there. I think it's pretty straightforward. I, I love the tip. If you've ever watched uh, a lot of Roddick or Agassi matches. When they were winning, they were just trying to keep it moving as fast as they could. They weren't. They were gonna. Not, they were gonna use maximum time on the serve clock. They were yeah. gonna get up there. I mean, Roddick, you know, doing his like going through his routines quick, and then just smacking another ace yeah. when things are going well. But yeah, ace service winner, ace forehand winner. Exactly. It's Jim like, man, sense. I'm down three zero. It's been fifteen seconds. Yeah. All right, number four. And guys, again, feel free to throw some questions in here. I see a couple. Actually, I'll grab this one from Harns TF. Should you try and impose and focus on your game instead of completely changing it based on your opponent, especially for aggressive players? I'll read that again just so everybody can see. Um, should you try and impose and focus on your game instead of completely changing it based on your opponent? So can I? May I? We're going to talk about this in just a minute. Okay. Never mind. I won't. Yeah. I will in a minute. <laughs> no. <laughs> Dad said no, Harns. Yeah. I'll get there in a yeah. second. Stay Sorry. tuned for just a minute. We'll, we'll give up, give away all the good stuff. We're going to get there in just a minute. <laughs> all right. So I think uh, number four, this is a mistake, right? Hitting your first serve with the same pace all match is something we don't want you to do. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You got to change up your serve, guys. So we're guilty sometimes, right? We remember that time we got over the three digits and it's like we, we go into these servers and we just keep trying to drop the big serve. We've got to be aware of what our percentages are because, you know, maybe you've got a dozen serve winners, but at the end of the, the first set, if you're serving in the 30, 40% first serves, I mean, 60, 70% of the time, your opponent's looking at second serve. Something is wrong here, right? Like we get enamored with the big serve and we want to keep chasing it. Maybe it's the aces or whatever else, but you got to, the second serves, you're giving them every opportunity to take advantage of your serving position. I don't think people realize this. And when I pointed out, most players are like, that makes total sense. If you're hitting your big serve on your first serve sometimes, then your opponent has to take you seriously and they've got to play further back off the baseline, right? So like, let's say Nate's uh, back here serving. I won't make fun of you too hard. So Nate's back here serving. Like the dude's got a big first serve. I've got to respect it. I've got to play behind the baseline. The dude does not have a huge second serve. So, like, that allows me – it's not bad, but it allows me to step in Are you talking about closer me? to the baseline. Yeah. <laughs> it allows me to step in closer to the baseline. So, guess what? Every single time he misses a first serve, 
that means I've immediately gained position because I feel comfortable standing on the baseline. If Nate's just putting first serves in the court, they're going to do more damage on the first serve because I'm forced to play behind the baseline and assume a bigger first serve is coming. So if you're struggling with your first serve, you can interlace some lower paced first serves and still get the benefit of your opponent standing further behind the baseline and not attacking them. Sure. This goes, I mean, at the rec level, this is everything, right? If you're at a 3-0 level where you're serving 80 miles an hour on your first serve and then you're cupcaking that second ball in maybe, or, or it's a yeah. lot weaker, you know, you're going to see your opponent standing here for your first serve and all the way here just ready to eat it for lunch for That's the second That's what we serve. see, man. It's crazy. So the second piece of this is that you've got to change up the spins. It shows my age. I'll use this with the academy kids, and they're like, who? But as a junior, I would always Arthur say – Arthur Yeah. No. <laughs> I go that far. But I would always use – I'd tell my students, hey, you want to be Greg Maddox, Nolan Ryan. You're not trying to be Randy Johnson. right? Think about what Greg Maddox did phenomenally. He had every pitch. right? He, you could not – figure out what he was going to throw next. He kept you out of rhythm. And so that is the second piece of this is on your serve, use the slider, use the kick serve, right? Use the body serve on your first serve. Don't reserve the top spin serve, the kick serve only for your second serve. For sure. Right. Like I would have moved them around the, the plate, right? Like, so like Scott, Scott's got an excellent return and if I'm it's the nicest thing Nate's ever said about me on camera, you got a, you got a, you got a pretty darn good return. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Right. But so like if I'm getting hot on the first serve and I'm hitting my marks, like at some point he starts taking it early and starts kind of redirecting. He's starting to read the patterns or whatever. So what I've got to do is, you know, try to play him off a of position. I've, I've, maybe I take the slice out on the deuce court, get him to respect it further out wide so I change his position. Let me show you this. All right, I'm like explaining it, and I can be showing it to you. But if I'm serving, and oops, stand in front of the board, bro. Yeah. But every time I serve, right, like I'm hitting this big serve through the tee, and Scott's like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing this ball pretty good now. I'm gonna step in and I'm gonna drive it to your backhand." Like that's not that's not the pattern I want to be playing at all. So the change would be is now. I'm going to slice out wide, get Scott to move here, right? Because the next time I'm around on the deuce court and I go to serve, Scott's original position will change. He's not going to lean on the T serve. He's got to respect my wide slice. So he'll hedge his bets a little bit, right? He'll, he'll, he'll stay a little bit more off over to his right. And now this improves my T serve again. Now I can introduce the body serve, right? It's because I'm mixing up my pitches all my serves get better makes sense i mean guys if you think about it also at a high level or even at a rec level if you get the same thing for an entire match you may win the first set odds are by the start of the second set your opponent's gonna be pretty dialed in and your serve's not gonna be as effective as it was so you can't just go you can't like you can't no one ryan have the pitcher call number one and just throw the fastball every single time yeah. in the same spot you know, eventually people are going to get, you know, they're going to get the rhythm and, and your serve is going to become less effective. So I think that's a great tip. All right, we're into the top three now. All right, all right, all right. Um, a couple of plus comments. David, thank you. David says playing the score definitely helps win a surprising amount of my love 40 games on my serve. Make the opponent beat you. That's definitely good advice. Yeah, Putting that ball sure. on the court. Um, and, and putting the pressure back on your opponent is huge. Christopher said, I believe that if you've got a real good kick serve, use it exclusively. It works pretty well for Stefan Edberg and Pat Rafter. Do you want to talk about the Agassi example, actually, about how um, when he said – like there was a tell on Agassi's serve. No, no, it's Becker. Becker. And for Sorry. whatever – it's ironic you said that. That was, uh, that was in the news, like ATB tennis. And it, it, I don't know what – for whatever reason, it started recirculating again. But – yeah, essentially Agassi really struggled with Boris Becker early on. And then he realized, and they show footage of it. Of the tongue. The tongue. Yeah. Yeah, that every time Boris was going out wide, he'd stick the, his tongue to the corner of his mouth. And then every time he was going body or T, his tongue would come and be flush on his lip. And so Agassi never told him. And uh, he, he's telling this story, and he's like, finally, Boris and I are retired, and we're sitting in a bar in Germany. He takes me out for some beers, and I was like, Boris, you know um, you know, you had a tell? 
He's Boris like slams everything down. He's like, I would go home and tell my wife after playing you that it's like he reads my mind. He knows where I'm going every time. Yeah. There's also a story that is not actually the story I was talking about. No. Uh, the story I was talking about Agassi. I think he was with Brad Gilbert. Oh, oh yes. Where he's just like, yes. you can know where I'm going to serve. If I hit it well enough, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there is that at, at the highest, highest level for sure. Christopher, you're right, man. Like, at the highest level, if you're Andre Agassi or any of these top players, you're hitting the ball well enough in a certain spot over and over and over again, there's really no defense for it, even at our level, right? Like if Nate's serving really, really well out wide on a given day, what are my options here really, right? I'm out of position. We just covered earlier in this call that going down the line is a really bad idea because Nate's going to run it down and have me instantly on the run. So my options here really are to try and get the ball back cross court Anything I don't get really passed about right here, anywhere from here to here should honestly be an instant winner for Nate down the line, right? It's going to be a step around forehand from right here. It's going to step around, hit this inside out. So if you're hitting again, if, if you're hitting your serve well enough to certain spots and you can do it reliably over and over and over again, yeah, I mean, I would say keep doing it. Your story relates a whole lot more. Yeah. yeah your, <laughs> yours was fun though. Mine was I'm good glad we could have yeah. that. Uh all right, number three. Um, dun, 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 dun. Stick with the one pattern of play that is working, and that is what you are supposed to do or are not supposed to do. That is what you're supposed to do. Okay. Right? So that's going Stop to – Yeah, so a little bit of the question from our, our gentleman earlier that was asking about mixing it up. I'll, I'll, I'll go more in depth than that in just a moment. But So what we see a lot of times is – you are doing something correct on the court and you've got your lead, right? So we, we, we get asked all the time, how many times have we heard this? I was up four one. I don't know what happened. And so our first question will be, well, what was your opponent doing? Nothing. I don't, yeah. I, I don't, I just, I just disappeared or whatever. But then when we watch matches, we chart matches. What, what we often see is that as humans, we get bored and it's hard to focus on a little yellow ball for a long duration. So, you know, We've been primarily playing a little left of center, playing our forehand to the opponent's weaker backhand. Um, but but now I'm introducing some some drop shots. You know, now I'm I'm coming in, I'm I'm savoring, I'm taking some returns, I'm rushing into the net, uh, I'm engaging the forehand that I've been avoiding the entire time. You're losing track of like what's happening because like you're just getting kind of bored with it. You're trying to get creative and win a different way. Right. Right. And and then on the pro tour. It doesn't matter who you look at. They all do one, two, maybe three patterns better than anyone else in the world. We do this when players come to train with us. So we have a thing called fix your technique in, in six months. You come down, we get every one of your strokes in slow motion video analysis. But the big takeaway for our students there that we hope for is that they understand, Nate always says this, their sir, their, excuse, excuse me, cut, their sword, their shield, and their Achilles heel. And then we build patterns of play around this. So you're going to understand, man, my sword, this is my forehand. This is the weapon that, you know, whenever I need to attack or end the point, I can do it with my forehand. My shield, what is it? You know, maybe it's my backhand. It's not, it's not a weapon, but it's something that I always get back in the court. What is my Achilles heel? Maybe it's the low ball. Every time somebody hits you a low backhand, you know, you're going to dump it in the net. But the idea here is you're not going to stick with one pattern of play across multiple opponents, but in each match yeah. – there's going to be one that you're going to zone in on that's going to work where you're using your sword, your shield, and trying to avoid your Achilles heel to pick apart the other player's Achilles heel and shield. Create, it's, yeah, I guess perfect. I mean, simply put, create, creativity kills. Yep. Right? It, it, it's, it, if you in the warm-up, what's the weakness? What's the pattern that highlights my strength and puts more pressure on their weakness? It's really as simple as that. Yeah, uh, 100%. Now, going back to – the the previous um the the previous question that the gentleman had i was looking at it two different ways i'll give you the, the, the kind of two answers here the first should you change how you're playing according to who you're playing yes and no and i have to qualify this the way i thought about it the first time was a lot of times i have players that are like i'm playing scott and he's so good like i got to go for more right do you let's find out Right. Let's go out there. Let's play some percentage tennis, because something that happens a lot of times is when better players are playing weaker players, they have the more pressure. They may make more mistakes. If you go out trying to play a game that's not yours 
and you start making mistakes and you hand them the match, you never really tested them. Right. But maybe, you know, you're playing deep cross court is enough to get them to press. To your point, you played this morning and was at two all with a gentleman with a weaker player because he was like, I'm better. I'm going to hit winners. Yeah. Right. Like things could have got weird if things are at four all and you got a little bit of scoreboard pressure. That's right. Scott's experience. So he dropped back and said, hey, I'm not going to miss a whole lot. This guy's got to figure out how to win some points. Let me show you something here, too, on the board that I think will be helpful. Um, so. Let's talk about the situation where Roger Federer goes out there in the second or third round of a tournament and loses to somebody you've never in your life heard of. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And so many people question, like, how on earth did Roger Federer lose to that person? Clearly that person is much worse. And here's how. So we have sort of a general rule of thumb. That's an eraser. <laughs> we have a general rule of thumb where you take each half of the court – and you divide it right down the middle, and it's a little hard to see on this angle, but the idea here is that the deuce side from the single sideline, excuse me, from the T to the single sideline, dead smack in the middle, same thing, T to the single sideline, dead smack in the middle, this creates three zones of the court. The inside zone is what we would automatically consider offensive, right? Now, if you're faster, if you're Nadal, these lines may be pulling you know, all the way out here, because you're so fast that you can get here and sort of cover back to the middle of the court. But the rule that we're looking for, um, if you're trying to play somebody, let me just erase these guys real fast. If you're playing somebody that you just know for a fact is better than you. So if I'm going out there and I'm playing Roger Federer, guess what? Roger Federer has a better cross court forehand than I do. Roger Federer has a better backhand cross court than I do. So I don't have a lot of options to really get into like a rally ball here that's going to turn out that well. So what my coach would tell me is, look, we want you to play aggressive but sensibly aggressive. If you see a ball that's close to these center thirds, even maybe a little bit outside, I want you to play more aggressive, maybe go for the ball down the line and come into the net. And what's going to happen is this is a lower percentage shot, but if you don't take this lower percentage shot against somebody who's way better than you at cross-court yeah. ground strokes, you have no chance of winning. So when you see some random no-name beat Roger Federer, he's taking these chances and, and to be quite honest, he's playing out of his mind and getting a little bit lucky that day and making a lot more of them than he normally would. And all of a sudden, he upsets you know one of the best players. He of played all time. to the moment, right? So, yeah. so that's probably a way to think about adjusting, particularly against players that you know are just better than you in every capacity. If you're a three-five going out there against a four-zero, you're probably not going to just push their house down. You know, identifying the warm-up. Is this cross-court forehand better than mine? Is this cross-court backhand better than mine? Is this serve going to blow me off the court? Pick apart these things in the warm-up. Start to figure out what the weakness is and what patterns you can create. And if you can't figure out those patterns, then it's time to take a bigger risk and be more aggressive sure. or a little bit more out of position. When it's we were the discussing only time it, we'll kind of let you play a little more offensive when you're a little bit more defensive. Kind of have to. Right. Hey, yeah, for sure. Um, and what occurred to me like when we were discussing all this, though, is like I don't want this to be confused with should you change your strategy if, you're, if, you're, if your gameplay – doesn't necessarily match up or if you can expose something right like so in our singles course we talk about you know deactivating the all-american all these different things like yeah if you can't hit with somebody junk them junk them to death i'll tell you point right? blank. if you want to win right like most players have a hard time going there but it's like yeah so, so just, just to clarify that yes you can change your pattern of play according to who you're playing if it makes sense right i love it all right, on to the top two. Guys, at this point, if you have any questions for us and anything that we say, go ahead and drop them in chat, whether you're plus or on Facebook. I see we've already got a handful of questions on Facebook. Jay, Paul, Talia, uh, Phoenix, YT, Justin, I see you guys. I will make sure we get to you here at the end. So just stick around uh, till the end here as we get through these last two, and we'll, we'll, we'll run through all these questions and then the other ones that you guys – Want to go ahead and add in here. And then also remember, if you're on this live chat and you're not a Plus member, you can go here to get 50% off. I'm just dropping a link in the chat for you guys. If you're like, I don't know what Player Court Plus is, um, there are people right here in our Plus Zoom room. At the end of this call, we'll be able to open up questions. We'll be able to see them. We'll be able to turn their camera on, talk to us. They also have access to every single video course tip we've ever created and also access to our full-fledged community. So if you want that, 50% um, off through that link I just sent you. And we are right now also offering our single strategy and tactics course plus three bonuses at 75% off. It's only $199. It's actually $500 
worth of instruction with those bonuses that you're getting for 49 bucks if you go here to this link. Put it in Sunday, 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 Sunday. Sunday, <laughs> Sunday. All right, so on to our last two tips here. Um, I don't know that YouTube yourself is the appropriate way to say this, yeah, but yeah. But yeah. Uh, tip number two is get yourself on, on camera and, Video yourself. and, and, and be Ian, surprised. Ian Westermeyer would be so happy with this right yes. now because so, he's so always talking about this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, this is why getting yourself from video is so important, right? If you want to learn who you are as a player, there's only one way to know. People can tell you, right? You, we, we have these ideologies like kind of who we think we are. And I can tell you when you see yourself on camera multiple and not just one time, like multiple times, you start realizing like, man, I did not realize I'm, I'm, I'm making these bizarro decisions on these. Yeah, it's points. not just for technique. Yeah. I can't, like that's extremely important. I think a lot of players are like, I already know what my forehand looks like. Do you know what it looks like under pressure at four all in the third set of a match? Yeah. That's what you need to be looking at. And your tendencies and the mistakes you're making, charting a match is also one of the most incredible yeah. things you can do. Just the data for me on a student is always like, because it's always so different than what they said, right? Like I'll, I'll chart a student's match and they'll come off the court. I'm like, I'm just missing so many cross-court backhands. I'm like, uh, you missed three cross-court backhands, but you made you know 75 unforced errors yeah. from trying to play offense when you're on defense. So, And I think it is see, seen as believing. You know, I went through a period where I was a pretty – uh, emotional teenager on court. I got a little fiery. And like, I, I remember, you know, my dad being like, your body language is horrible. Like you, you look miserable out there. And I was like, I'm fine. Like are you talking about like, I'm, I'm, I'm positive. Alone, dad. And I saw myself from video and I was like, I'm, I'm sulking. I'm, I look, I'm, I'm, I look like I've, I've already lost and I'm ready to shake hands. Like sometimes you have to see that stuff in order for it to, to ring true. But yeah, videoing yourself, seeing the technique, learning your tendencies on court, that stuff is huge. For sure. On to the last number one here. On to the one. This the is top, the top tip for today. This this is, we're sort of joking, right? These are just 10 tips that we think will help, but this one is big. Um, forget about the results and develop a growth mindset. This is so spiritual, I'll let you go. I mean, this is, this is my personal mantra yeah this is everything and you have to buy into it and it's extremely difficult i'll give you that disclaimer we're working with a, a gentleman that's a, a, one of the best foros in florida we're working through these ideas uh kind of right now we become so result based we become what our result is and you know we talk about judgment and, and nerves and stress and everything else but if i'm constantly worried about what the result is. How do I find optimal performance? And this may ring home true to you, right? Like it, I'm playing line three dubs. And if I lose, I might be out of the lineup. If I lose to her, I may get my rating bumped down and everyone will think that I'm only a three five. If he beats me, everyone at the country club will make fun of me. Yeah, I mean, it goes on and on, right? Like it's the same social pressures that our kids are dealing with on Instagram right yeah. now. And it just, shouldn't take over your tennis process. And guess what? It's 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 all of us. Yep. I mean, man, like we put ourselves out on our camera and we're like, we do this for a living. Yep. What if it's not if that good? If any of you saw me play <laughs> Ian, um, wow, that was stressful, right? Yeah, that was rough. It was, I mean, that whole, that whole, it was yeah. just a stressful day, right? And it's not, it's like I've played tennis before and like Ian and I are like best buddies. Like I'm not nervous because it's Ian. I'm nervous because I know – the internet's gonna watch and like, oh my gosh! Like if I if I ease off and start rolling the ball, like I'm gonna get trolled by YouTubers for being a 3-0. and it's just like all of that stuff doesn't matter, right? In tennis, at the end of the day, you gotta enjoy the process. It's kind of like life life advice. You're not just tennis yeah. advice, but for real, like if you're constantly worried about, man, my rating's a three five, and I really need to be a four zero, and that's what you're worrying about. You're worrying about, you know, the the results versus the process. I think the process becomes so miserable that. It's just not even fun to be involved in it yeah. anymore. So how do we get there, right? It's all about goals. And, and these, it, it takes time. You're not going to turn this over in a day. And so I'm going to be part of this growth mindset and just really work through the progressions until I get where I want to be and not worry about results. You've got to write down goals. You've got to give them, your coach has to give them to you, your teaching press to give them to you, you have to give them to yourselves. And these can be as simple as, I'm going to go to the net 10 times in this match. I'm going to 
you know, try to keep my first percentage, first serve percentage in the 60s. I'm going to try and put every return in the court today versus playing too aggressive. You got right? it. Yeah, it's these things, and you, you, they make you accountable, and they take the pressure off because, like, what you realize is that you're growing as a player and you're reaching these goals. So, Ian well, actually we, talks a ton about this too, about how when you go out on the court, you've got to have a goal for the day, not just winner, winning and losing. It's what I tell our kids is is it's like going to the gym. And expecting a result the first day in the gym. Right. Why do we go to the gym? We know it's good for us. And it's miserable at first, but then we get done, the endorphins are going, everything feels good. We do it because we trust the process that if we continue to do it, you know, we'll get stronger, our performance will get better, and everything else. So why shouldn't competing be the same way? Right. And and what happens is that you accidentally fall in love with the process and then all the pressure comes off and you don't become you're not this definitive result at the end of the match oh my god i'm a three five now what is everyone going to think it's like okay so you, you you took this l what did you learn for it from it and how do we apply it to the next match and your goal of being a four five you're four of your goal is a four five don't worry about what happened you know yeah. one or two matches i have a life rule that i follow and this applies to tennis and i know it's going to sound corny so brace yourself but if it won't affect you in five years don't worry about it for more than five minutes I think that's a good rule to live by. And, and tennis is no different. Like, we think the the sky has fallen when we lose to a player that's a lower rating than us, right? We're so embarrassed. Like, five years from now, that ain't going to matter. Enjoy the process. That's a learning experience. That's just another reason to get back out on the court and work on some things. So I think that is uh, that is honestly our, our, the most important tip we can give you. I know it's kind of cheesy, but enjoy the process of improving your tennis game. Don't just focus on the results. It's not healthy. And that's where, like, you want to be playing just that the one point at a time. Right. right. Did I make the right decisions? Did I stick to my goals in this individual point? And all of a sudden you realize you, you're up 5-1. Oh, I love this from Christopher and Plus. He says, I think yeah. after all is said and done, we each have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, why do I play tennis? I think that's fantastic. Yeah. There we go. I think that's fantastic. I just love chasing that silly yellow, yellow ball and just, man, just getting that pure contact. Yeah, there is something that just feels good about a, a forehand right in the sweet spot. It's a golf. That's why I hated tennis golf. for about a year and a half because I just went away for a second. All right. I remember. <laughs> so we've got a bunch of questions in here. I, of course, am going to go to our plus folks first and get you guys on screen here. So let's see here. David, let me get you up and unmuted. And Pena. All right. Can you hear us? I can hear you. David, Very what's nice. up, man? What's going on, man? How are you? How's it going? I'm doing well. Good, dude. Happy Tuesday. So I've, I've got your uh, question here you wanted to ask about. You know what? I'll let you ask it in your own voice since you have one now. Sure. Um, I'll try to keep it briefer than I typed out. Uh, but basically want to ask about shot selection and variety. So okay. obviously grew up huge Fed fan. Uh, lots of different shots in, the, in that toolkit, right? Forehand slice, backhand slice um heavy top spin flat shot um with having so many different options on a tennis court how do you manage um all of your different options and sort of learn to pick the correct one of those for the right situation you want me to go get it you want to add on to it yeah i think a lot of it is understanding your strengths and weaknesses right so like for me I can hit a slice backhand. I know it's not necessarily something I want to be doing unless it's the absolute Achilles heel for my opponent, right? So I'm picking and choosing, and I have an Eastern foreign and prefer to hit flat foreigns, but I also know that some people hate high loopy backhands, right? So yeah. my shot selection is going to be purely based off of the patterns that my opponent doesn't want to see. Um, and then a lot of it's based on your skill level too. Not everybody's going to have, you know, the short buggy whip backhand cross court you know, ground stroke. So you've got to play within your limitations, but I think playing within your limitations in putting players in situations they're not comfortable with is sort of always the goal. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. I mean, kind of what you described, that's what we've seen with, with Grigor Dimitrov, right? Like through his career, that dude has everything and he just can't figure out how to when use what, how to put it all together. Right. He has these flashes of brilliance. Um, my, my suggestion in, in doing what fed does is build patterns right? Like know when to use what tool in any given situation. So for example, you know, if he's returning on the ad court, a lot of times he's going to chip that return 
talked about it briefly earlier, either or either deep in the court to reset or short to bring the opponent in, right? He knows what that tool does in a specific moment, right? He's not just slicing the backhand in the middle of the court when he could come over the ball, unless he's intentionally trying to change up the pace per se, but he's building these things into patterns, right? It's like a slicer, slicer on the deuce court. He's going to hit it 70% of the time, and then he's going to hit a forehand into the open court, and he's going to come in. He's taken three shots, his serve, his forehand, his volley, and he's put it all into a pattern that he just runs on repeat over and over and over again, right? So that would be my suggestion, man, is like make sure with all those tools, they all have a home. Yep. Know where they go. I think that's good advice. Does that help, my dude? I think so. That's, uh, that's good advice, too, and I, I appreciated the um, – you know, the, I forget which number tip it was before, but if it's, you know, if, essentially if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if the pattern's working, keep doing that. So it's definitely something I'm going to try to do some more of. For sure. Don't get, there's the need for creativity does not exist. If you're, if you're, if you're handily winning the first set, maybe one or two. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> don't encourage me. <laughs> <laughs> To try one drop shit. No, it's good. <laughs> All right, David. I appreciate you, man. Hope we'll see you on the next one. Bye, right, buddy. I'm gonna mute you and unpin you. And all right, Christopher, my man. Let me get you up here. And you should be able to unmute yourself now as well. Christopher. Christopher, can you hear us, dude? I sure can, buddy. Oh, uh, there we All go. Right. All right. So I liked your question yeah. here, and I really liked your quote, man, the uh, looking ourselves in the mirror and, and asking ourselves while we play tennis. Yeah. Thank you. It's well, hard to do. It's hard for some people to answer. Yeah. It really is. So I like this question as well. Do you suggest we play the ball or play the opponent? So I think I think the term play the ball is more like, when you're trying to rein your players in to have stronger mental technique than they're showing currently, is that how you read that? Like I'm always playing my opponent. Yes. Say that again. I was focused on the screen. So right you know how, you know how it's like, it's one of those memes. I'm sure play, you know, don't play the opponent, play the ball. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm playing my opponent. I'm, I'm worried about my opponent's weaknesses and my opponent's strengths. Yeah. So I think where that comes in, where we, we talk about playing the ball is like one, you, you're, you're playing within yourself, right? Like you know who you are as a player, but more importantly, when we're focused on the ball, we're not worried about necessarily the hijinks, right. the momentum, right? So like if I'm playing somebody that plays horribly slow, I'm just playing a game that is involved with a little yellow ball. I can't focus on their, their tempo. I can't focus that they say, come on after every shot. Like that's where I really want to go into. And I think that's where it applies. Like I'm just playing the ball. Right. I'm, here to play the game because I yeah. can't stand the opponent. Because I can't stand the yeah. But uh, to to Scott's point, yeah. If you're if you're not paying attention to what's happening on the other side, if the guys strategically play your opponent, emotionally play the ball. Yeah. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Can you put that on? I'll put that on a t-shirt tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> He's like, no, that was useless. It's like more than most things Nate says. So I don't know. This is good enough. <laughs> Um, anything else for us while, while you're live on camera here, my man? No, everything's good. Great call. And I, I like your, your ordering and, uh, particularly the number one, uh, what you guys had is number one about growth and going through the process. Cause I really think that's the key. Yeah. I appreciate that. So many players really forget, good. even when they're trying to make improvements, sometimes you got to take a step back to take two steps forward. I know a lot of players that we run into like, well, I don't want to change my back and I've got to play Tuesday night. I'm like, you're going to play Tuesday night for probably the rest of your life and you can fix that backhand or not. But, yeah, it's a process. So well, right. I've always felt that a lot of tennis players compete too early before they develop strokes and they right. develop some bad habits that they never, ever, ever get rid of them. I agree with that completely. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks for tuning in. Thanks, guys. Good call. Thanks, thanks you. man. Good seeing you. I am going to remove your pin here. All right, heading over to the Facebook group. I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of questions here. We may not get through all these, but I will do my best. I've seen three different people ask about how to play against serve and volleyers in singles. Um, I'm going to give you a very quick tutorial um, that's based purely off of how far your opponent gets to the net when they serve and volley. And this is like very 
very baseline guidance that I think will help. And then Nate's smarter than me, so I'm sure he'll have something smarter to say. But we're going to start here. Don't you nod to that. <laughs> All right, so here's what's up. When you're playing singles, if your opponent has just a nasty big first serve, they're crushing the ball. We're talking 80, 90 plus miles per hour. There's no possible way they could be making it very far into the net. All right, so here's the problem. Two things have happened. If they're crushing their serve, you're probably on defense. They're probably not making it very close to the net when you make contact with the ball. And the solution that we're looking for is to drop the ball down at their feet. All right. So not overly helpful. And, and, and I know that when you're getting blasted off the court, but when you've got somebody that's got a big serve and you've got a play on it, you know they don't have time to make it that close to the net. So you know you've got a lot of space in front of them to dip the ball. All right. So pay attention to this. And at the rec level, maybe the serve isn't that big. Maybe they're hitting, you know, 60 miles an hour and just trotting up to the net and they're in closer to the net. That means you've got more opportunities to pass them or go over their head, right? The closer they are to you, the shorter the distance and time they have to react. So the more successful passing shots and lobs will be because they're going to do more damage, right? So that's sort of just like a crash course on pay attention to when your part, when your opponent serves and volleys, where are they settling when you're making contact? If it's behind the service line, you should be trying to dip at their feet, get them to pop it up, and then put the ball away. If they really are crashing all the way to the net and getting in close, you should be trying to pass them and lob them. You want to add? No, he nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, no, moving on. I'll just say one more thing. I mean, you did pretty good. Um, something that I, I always suggest is playing at the volleyer, right? Yeah. Remember, when, when your opponent – is coming to the net. I knew he'd have something smart to say. <laughs> they want – can I draw? You're nice. How do you throw that over to me? Oh, big up. There you go. I kind of forgot how to use this. Thanks, buddy. All right. But so when the Did you opponent... forget that they can't see the TV when your back is in front yeah. of them? Yeah. You want to trade spots? No, I'm good. I'm good. Right. But if I'm playing this ball on the – outside of this uh, i don't want you to move i want you to just go here all right we can kind of see that i'll draw that a little bit better oh that's okay i'm gonna draw this a little bit bigger all right so that's a triangle if i play on the outside of this triangle what is going to happen i put the ball out here they're going to find the ball and be able to attack the line Okay, and this is not what I want. I don't want to be in a position they're hitting into a space that is going to get to its target much, much faster. And then I'm stuck to where I'm probably going to have to play this ball back up to them, right? So it's the same thing over here. If I try to get the ball around them, this person, the volleyer, plays well outstretched. They're also able to play the ball into the shorter distance, right? So it's going to get me in trouble, right? So Eraser, please. Um, look at that. I love this TV. You're welcome. <laughs> Sometimes dad buys nice things. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But now if I play them within this space, right? So the volleyers come in. I'll put them at the end of this triangle here. No, that's the wrong one. <laughs> All right. So now when I've played inside this space, what's often happening is that they're playing on a cross court right so now if they're playing this way now i get to move out to the ball and i can look to create angles right. all right so now they're kind of in this guessing situation they've pulled me to the outer thirds of the court they're in the middle of the court and they have to figure out if i'm going to go down the line or if i'm going to go cross court right so playing inside to a volleyer is always a great strategy in singles. At skill, a skill level specific, really anybody below a 4-0, just ripping right at their chest, I think is a very good strategy for this exact reason, right? I think you're just going to have a lot of opportunities. Most players aren't so good that they're going to take a chest volley or a volley at their or volley at their belly button and knife a winner, right? So I love that strategy. I mean, I, I would take it even one step simpler. 
the lower the level is just get the ball back and play and make them beat you, right? You should have multiple yeah. chances to pass if you're if you're not freaking out. Yeah, I think that I think what happens is we try to pass early, and that's exactly where the volleyer wants you to go. They want you to play on the outside of the court so that they can create the angle. Play on the inside, force them to play through the middle, or play on a cross court to where then you can pass. I agree completely. All right, Talia S wants to know, what do I do if my second serve is that cupcake serve? How do I still have a chance to win the point? So I'm going to go quickly, and then you're going to, again, probably have something smarter than this to say. But I think it comes back to what we talked about, getting more first serves in play. Um, because, again, if your first serve – maybe your second serve is the cupcake, but if your first serve has enough pace on it where they have to respect it, then you can take some off your first serve every now and again just to get a higher percentage of first serves and, and put yourself in that situation less often. I think the honest solution is get out there and practice that second serve. But Yeah, sure. Yeah, but now for the immediate results, right? I would get, you know, even with targeting, if your targeting gets really good, if it's a cupcake, they're going to run around it. They're going to find their forehand or whatever else. Um, always advise, like, when players are thrown in kind of the cupcake, they're always focused on themselves and what this, what they did with the serve. Get really good at reading the visual cues, right? Read, are, are they getting ready to drop you, right? It's the racket up and it looks like they're volleying on the return. They're getting ready to slice and pull you in. Are they winding up and they're moving the forehand? Like those things will give you a fighting chance. Like you're you're in a tough position because if you have a cupcake serve, you're essentially giving them a, a mid-court ball and approach shot. So you've got to be ready to read the defense and make them do things that they don't want to do. If you have somebody that's constantly chipping you and bringing you in, read it, get up there fast and make them do something different because you're reading what they're doing. But until you've really improved the serve, that's kind of where it's kind of where we're at. It's kind of what we have to work with. For sure. All right. Phoenix YT asks, how do I play a player that gives high balls? What you do is you take the link to our single <laughs> strategy and tactics course that I just put in chat and you buy it. And no, I'm just kidding. You should do that, but we'll, we'll talk about it. So a player that hits high balls, I'm going to label them as a pusher, maybe a little bit quick, but I'm going to do it for the sake of this wow. coaching session. Aren't you just full of labeling just people? full of calling you a pusher. So if you're playing a player that's throwing up a lot of high balls, the solution is sort of a combination of some of the things we talked about today. It's playing offense from offensive positions, and it's staying patient, right? So a high ball that's going to land – out of position or that's going to force us really far behind the baseline is a different situation than a high ball that's going to land at the service line. So my goal would be to try and do enough damage where I can move in and take one of those high balls out of the air and volley into open court space. All right. So I'm not going to force this. And again, Nate talked about this in one of the other tips. I'm not going to try and hit overhead winners from the service line, but I am going to try and slowly transition to the net by waiting for a ball that's in the middle third of the court or that pulls me inside the baseline to attack and then move in and take that next high ball and do damage. We talk a ton about this in our YouTube video, how to beat pushers. So definitely give that a watch if you haven't already. Um, do you want to add anything to that? It's I'll just uh, develop a swing volley, right? Yeah. When you get a ball, when they're throwing this thing way up here, right? The minute that you can start moving in and hitting swing volleys, from here, right, you're going to be in a much better position. And I think the absolute key, right, is when you have an opportunity, get them to net. Yep. Right. If they have a weak second serve, chip and bring them in, just like we were the talking dink about. Dink them and dunk them strategy. Yeah. That's yeah. in that course as well. Yeah. You got to bring them in, right? People that want to roll up high and throw big rainbows don't necessarily want to be at the net. So they give you a weak second serve, chip, bring them in, and then look to pass them, look to lob them, or come up to the net and intercept. I love it. Couple more here, guys, and we're gonna have to shut it down. Otherwise, I'm gonna get divorced. Um, <laughs> Donald Choi, I love this. So Donald says, "I'm a 73 year old player, and I'm always playing those that are 10 to 15 years younger than me. I love watching your tips. Thanks, man. Appreciate um, it. Any Thank advice you. on improving my choice of shots? So I'm not gonna assume Donald is slow, but I may assume that he's slower than players that are 15 years younger than him. He's 73 years old." Any instant shot choice, it's kind of hard without seeing. And Donald could be in better shape than we are, for all we know. But well, I think it goes back to what we were saying a little bit earlier um, on the call: is that if I don't want to move a ton, I don't want to put my, I don't want to play the ball into positions that are going to make me move. So going back to kind of what Scott was saying earlier, I'll just show you real quick. If I'm constantly changing direction, right? If I'm in the middle of the court 
and my opponent, you know, a little bit cross court. They hit cross court to me. Boom, there's the cross court. I go, ooh, I'm going to play this down the line. Now you're going to be running, right? Because you've got to – you can maybe come over towards here, but if they play the ball down the line, they're going back behind you, right? Um, and if you stay over here, they're going to make you run to the cross court. So where should we go if we don't want to run a lot? Play really deep and heavy through the middle of the court. And here's the best thing. Don, is that guys that are younger probably aren't patient. We've learned patience, right? Yeah. Like in our lives. We've, now that we're old. Yeah. Well, we're not, we're not, we're not there, but right. But you, you can play patient. So with some of these guys playing deep through the middle and let them make boneheaded choices, right? Especially as you get a little bit tired throughout the match or, you know, as the match, but yeah, angles create angles. The more you're changing the direction of the ball, the more likely are they're going to have you running unless you're just on total offense. Cool. All right, guys, I'm going to open up one last question here. I'm going to go ahead and put these links in here because we're going to be shutting down after this question. So, again, the last link I just threw in there is 75% off our single strategy and tactics course. The link I just put in there right now that says playercourt.com slash tennis community 50 off is 50% off our regular community. If you're not in there already, it's a year of tennis for 25 bucks. Or if you're not in plus, it's every video course we've ever filmed, challenge, access to our Zoom sessions on calls like these, for just $59.99. So if you're interested in either of those things, go ahead and copy and paste those links now so you don't miss them as we shut it down. Last question we'll field tonight. Daniel Travis wants to know for the backhand, how do you make the ball go straight towards your opponent? I seem to always curve. I can knock that out quite quickly if you'd like me to. How quickly? <laughs> I'll give you how, no, how no, long, no, how long no, is this going to no, take you? You get it. You get to flip my uh, little pen drawer over to me first. What do you think? Should we give him two oh minutes? Oh my god! Hold on, hold on. Hasn't started yet. I got to get my five. tools ready. All right, here we go. So, regardless of what ground shake you're hitting, forehand or backhand, the way you aim in any direction is I want you to think about hitting through oh no, through three balls. So it doesn't matter what direction I draw these in. Whatever direction my racket extends, there's no, there's no perfect. That's that's not helping my timeline here. I'm going to let you visualize since I'm on the clock. When you think about hitting through three balls and you make contact and you extend as if you're making contact. I'll use a racket here. Extend as if you're making contact out through three balls. That's where your ball is going to go. Now, adjusting your hips in your shoulders to point in the direction you're aiming is how you're going to line your body up to have the most success doing this. So we see a lot of players with their hips and their shoulders pointing a different direction from where they want the ball to go. So whether you're hitting open stance or closed stance, we want to see those shoulders lined up in the extension out towards the target as if you're making contact with one, but then two, three balls before your wrist breaks. If you're saying your ball is curving a lot, my guess is that you're actually breaking right after contact and dipping that ball out wide. So contact 36 late. 36 seconds to go. Contact late or early? Contact on time, but extension out towards your target. Yeah. And you're adjusting your body. No, no, no. He's curving it, though. He's Are probably... you just trying to get me in this? <laughs> messed up, man. Hey, guys, you know what Scott did well there? He controlled the momentum of the mass. That's right. Yeah, that's that's the takeaway there. That's well right. done, dude. Daniel, I hope that helps, guys. We appreciate you tuning in. It's been about an hour and a half here. We're going to shut it down. We do do these once a month. I said do do. <laughs> we do do these once a month. Um, if you're a Plus member, you have the option. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We have a question from David. I'm not going to let a Plus member question go by the wayside. Yeah, what's going on? David, I'm bringing you back on. Hold on, brother. You guys thought we were out of here. No way. And... Like we're getting closer, like we can't wait to hear. It's like, what do you, what do you have to say, David? David, you're, <laughs> you're unmuted. I, I think. Know, I don't know. What do I have to say? <laughs> He's like, I don't have a question. I don't know what you're talking about, Scott. He says we covered defending against serve and volley. Any tips for executing a serve and volley? No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what are your thoughts on <laughs> on so? Oh, are you talking about like as far as the making that your strategy, serve and volley? Right. So if 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 uh, so, I've got a. I mean, 
I'm not fantastic or anything, but I'm six five, so I've got yeah. a stronger serve than than average for yeah. you know the people that I play with. So uh, a lot of times I'll get weak returns, um, kind of shorter in the court, and you know big guy doesn't like to run uh, really far or fast. So uh, in terms of like that's not really something I've done, um, but thinking of using that as a strategy as I've sort of encountered this as a sure. recurring problem. Oh, during, during I've got a couple. Lately. I got a couple quick ones, and then when you when we're done with this call, definitely um, check out either on the platform or on YouTube. Um, I think it's ten. Think think it's ten serve and volley tips. It's like one of my favorite videos, and we put a Such, lot of time on it. It did David, do David's that. David's well, a plus though. member, so he has access to everything. So yeah, go yeah. go. Um, have you used the video function where you can use the search bar to just search for anything you want inside the platform yet? Um, I don't think so, but I'm sure I can figure it out. Do that and search, just serve, uh, and scroll through to see, there's going to be a handful of serving volley videos that you can okay. cruise through, um, and get like a deeper dive, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Just so, so the quick ones, you definitely want to utilize the kick serve, top spin serve. Scott said it before, if you're hitting a flat serve, you have less time to get in. The kick is going to give you more time. Um, it'll stay out of their strike zone. It's going to give you the opportunity to get in a little bit tighter and read read what's happening and get through position. Um, second, the, one of the best plays on the servant volley is on that first volley is play behind them. Yep. When you come in, a lot of times the, the opponent's going to look and assume you're playing the open court, play the ball behind them, and nine out of ten times you're going to get a lob. Right? So being 6'5", I'm sure you absolutely love your, your overheads. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> you're like, yeah, dude. Um, but, yeah, so it, body serves – Always a big fan of body serves. Hard to change the direction of body serves, so the serves can be coming back through the middle, um, and that kind of goes as well with the first volley. Yeah, I think that's something that we we don't think about a lot, right? Is jamming them up even through the middle with with that volley. Um, but the number one for me, when should you serve a volley? If you see a high five, right? If your opponent is consistently blocking back returns, as soon as you see that high five, the hand going up, move in. If you see a coil. Right, they're feeling pretty good about what's happening on the return, but you see that hand go up, you should go in. You'll kind of be able to tell how well in the warm up if your opponent's like struggling to catch your ball. Um, then you, serve. yeah, then yeah. you know you've got probably a free pass to the net there for the at least for the first set till they get acquainted. But yeah, gotcha. Def, definitely check out the platform, man. If you just do a search in there for serve or serve and volley, there'll be a few videos in there that'll give you a deep dive on it. Gotcha. Any uh, maybe this one will be an easier, quicker version. Any any don't do uh, type tips for for a serving volley. Don't do. Don't do. Um, second serves are probably pretty rough, unless you've got a huge kick. Yeah, and and you can maybe mix it in. Like you get you can get a pass with it once or twice. Like first point of the match, run in after your second serve, and maybe they freak out. But like the days of like. Stefan Edberg and, and Tim, Tim Hinman and going in on first and second repeatedly is really, really difficult unless you have a pretty yeah, The ball solid. just moves too quick now. Well, yeah, yeah. It's like the, the Rockets, the Polys, the better athletes. I mean, like there's a thousand reasons as to why the ball moves. It does, I'm not saying don't go in. You should definitely go in, but the second serve is a tough one. Go. Sure. Gotcha. Thanks, guys. Yeah, well, man. man, thank you. Have a good rest of your night. Likewise. Appreciate it. All right, guys, we're going to shut it down here. It is 930 in Virginia Beach where we are. Appreciate you guys tuning in and watching. We will see you again a little less than a month. We'll do another one of these on another Tuesday night. So stay tuned. If you're in the Player Court membership, you'll see a calendar of what's coming up next right there on your dashboard. And if you're not in that Plus membership, we would love to have you. So be sure and join that. We'll see you guys soon. Cheers. Have a good night. See you.